Eliza went out on her 4 a.m. run like she always did every morning in Memphis. Monday of this week, Eliza's body was found. However, when Chris got there, shockingly, he found Michael unalive on the sofa in the garage. He For some reason, these both of these cases are like eerily similar to me. Last Friday morning, Eliza Fletcher went missing. Eliza went out on her 4 a.m. run like she always did every morning in Memphis. After she did not return from her run, her husband called authorities and a missing persons report was put out for her. Monday of this week, Eliza's body was found. Her body was found decomposing behind an abandoned building. A passerby had called in saying that they smelled like something was decomposing near the area and that's when her body was found. Cleotha Abstin, who is pictured here, was charged with her abduction and murder. Coincidentally, he was already convicted of an aggravated kidnapping 20 years earlier. When he was arrested, he refused to tell the police where her body was, so if someone hadn't have walked by and smelled that, she may never have been found. Say hello to Dr. Carl Tanzler. Tanzer was born in 1877 in Germany, and that is kind of where our story starts. Tanzler, for the longest time in his life, claimed that he was having dreams about a beautiful dark-haired woman who he was told he was going to have to save from some type of untimely death later down the line. So Tanzler went through his whole life continuing to look for this woman that he was supposed to save. Flash forward to the 1920s in Key West, where Tanzler is now working as a radiologist. He meets the beautiful Elena de Hoyos. Carl sees her and thinks, this is the woman from my dreams. She's the one that I have to save. Now, Elena is diagnosed with tuberculosis, which as we know now is not a very easily curable disease. So Carl takes it upon himself to personally treat her with all kinds of elixirs and potions he makes on his own to save her life. But Elena ends up dying anyway from TB. After she dies, Carl continues to have this obsession with her. Every single night, Tanzler is going to Elena's grave to speak with her, as he says. This story ends with Tanzler taking Elena's body out of the grave taking it to his home, mummifying her the best he possibly could, dressing her up, dancing with her around the house, and acting as if she were still alive. And the reason that Tansel was found out was because Elena's sister went to his home to beg him to stop going to see her every night at the grave because it was an unhealthy obsession and the family was tired of it. And through the window, she saw him dancing with her sister's corpse. There are photos of what Elena looked like when she was found in Tanzler's home, but I can't show them because of community guidelines. So the things that he did to her body after he took her out of her grave were truly horrendous. And he was arrested, but he was never charged with anything. A lot of people in the town took pity on him. And then it got worse when instead of putting Elena back to rest, the state of Florida put her body on display. Eventually, Elena was buried again in an unmarked grave. The family murderer is still out there. Michael and Mary Short were a couple who lived in Virginia with their nine-year-old daughter, Jennifer. They were known by their neighbors as just a good family who never bothered anyone, and Michael had a business moving mobile homes. In August 2002, Chris Thompson, one of Michael's employees, was working with him on a car. He left that evening to go back to the motel that he was staying in, and he was due to come back the next day. When he returned to Michael's house the next morning at 9 a.m., him and Michael were due to go and pick up a vehicle for the company. However, when Chris got there, shockingly, he found Michael unalive on the sofa in the garage. 
He straight away rang the police who arrived at the scene and found Michael's wife was also unalive upstairs in her bed. They had both been shot once and the weapon was nowhere to be found and also nowhere to be found was their daughter Jennifer. There was no sign of any particular struggle in the house. The pair had been killed while they were sleeping. Chillingly, the family's telephone line had been cut. There was also no sign of a robbery and interestingly, there was actually a bag of money on the side in the kitchen in plain sight, which hadn't been taken. Police kept very secretive about what they knew about this case, but they did reveal to the public that they were looking into the paternity of Jennifer. They let the public know that they did in fact have the information of who Jennifer's real biological father was, but they didn't actually release this to the public until shockingly Jennifer's remains were discovered. Horrifically, part of her skull was discovered by a family's pet dogs nearby around an hour away. It turns out Michael was in fact Jennifer's biological father, but the police had been working on a theory that maybe she'd been snatched in a paternity battle. While they didn't know whether she was alive or dead, they didn't reveal that information to the public because they were scared that the person who'd taken Jennifer was gonna dispose of her if they found out that she wasn't theirs. Another really interesting part of this case is that Mary had actually previously had a stalker about 10 years earlier. He had apparently turned up at her work on more than one occasion and been asked to leave. Police frustratingly couldn't find any details on this man and nobody came forward to say who he was. It was thought that maybe this was somebody that Mary could have been having an affair with because a year later she gave birth to Jennifer. This was kind of where the police got that theory from about the paternity battle. There's loads more to unpack in this case so I'm going to make a part two. Let's talk about what on earth happened to this family. This is part two. If you haven't seen part one, I'll link it down below. So there were no apparent suspects in this case. Chris, who was Michael's employee, who was due to meet Michael that morning at 9am, was actually cleared of being a suspect. He was apparently very cooperative with police and really helped them with their investigation and gave all information that he could. Frustratingly, there were several false witness statements and it turned out that these people were just coming forward with statements about seeing something that night in the hope of getting rewarded ward money. Now this man, Garrison, was actually accused early on. Garrison Bowman was a 66 year old carpenter and interestingly actually fled the country to go to Canada the day after the murders. Someone came forward to police and said that he'd actually been dealing with somebody who was in charge of transporting mobile homes and he wasn't very happy with him, which obviously could have been a motive. However, it was found that he was due to move to Canada regardless of the murders. He'd been planning it for quite a while. He also had several people that accounted for where he was on the night of the murders. One theory about what happened is that somebody had a grudge against Michael and this was just a grudge killing. Another theory is that Jennifer was the target of the attack. The evidence showed that she was probably killed elsewhere and taken from the home first. It obviously also could have been the person that apparently stalked Mary 10 years before. It's believed that the person responsible for these killings may have had some kind of knowledge of the family and what they did in the family home. The reason for this is that only people close to this family would know that Michael would regularly sleep on the sofa in the garage. This is because his snoring woke Mary up quite a lot. If this was a random attack, it seems really strange that they would have gone down to the garage and found Michael. Here's another really creepy part of this case. In 2019, the short family home was burned down in mysterious circumstances. People came up with many theories about this, including the fact that there may have been extra evidence in this house that the perpetrator wanted to get rid of. Two decades later, this mystery is still unsolved and the killer is out there somewhere. There is an $80,000 reward for any information leading to a conviction. So recently, a 19-year-old young black man was walking around a West Side Detroit neighborhood and he was shooting at people at random. He ended up killing three people. Now, this was such a random, senseless act, so it, it struck me as odd, but this photo, for some reason, struck me as odd as well. It just gives me a really bad feeling and he kind of gives me like... CGI vibes. I don't know why, but that's what I felt initially. Now, yesterday, another young black man, 19 year old black man, made the news for a random shooting in Memphis. Now, for some reason, these both of these cases are like eerily similar to me, and I'm gonna explain why. Most murders in the hood tend to have some type of motive behind them rather it's beef or gang affiliation. But both of these 19 year olds woke up and decided to shoot random people less than a week apart from one another. What the fuck is going on? Like, rest in peace to all the victims and condolences to their families. This is 38 year old Udell Bruno who lives in Maryland. And if you ask me, I think this is a perfect description of someone who is unwell. Her boyfriend was 40 year old Shimato Clark and allegedly they had been having some issues. 
Upon further looking, Udell actually had some charges for domestic assault back in 2005. I'm not really sure what triggered in her, but I'm assuming her and Shimato had an argument. She then got into her car and hit Shimato with it. Unfortunately, he did succumb to his injuries and passed away. Being that this just happened on August 20th, like literally a week ago, she's still awaiting charges. What do you think that she should be charged?